It's April 27th, 2021. Welcome to Podkaars. Uh, I'm Rico Brouwer. My guest is Jade Kuit. So she is Dutch. I'm Dutch. We're going to do this in English. So Bailey Lemon and all people reading our book will be able to revisit this, uh, this interview. So Podkaars. See. Our conversations with the candle, pot with candle. That's literally what it is. Conversations of hope. Welcome, Jade. Thank you. We do know each other. We have talked previously in Dutch. Uh, yeah. We're doing this in English, so the audience can um, revisit this talk. Um, to start off with, would you summarize in short what your outside of parliament investigative committee, or in Dutch, the Buitenparlementaire Onderzoekscomité, I'm, I'm doing the Dutch one because the abbreviation is BPOC. We'll yeah. likely reference it as BPOC 2020. Yeah. Could you start off with saying what the BPOC 2020 does? Um, well, we do hearings. Um, well, unofficially, of course, because um, it started when we asked um, the Tweede Kamer, the Parliament? House of uh, Parliament, yes, um, in the Netherlands to um, to perform uh, an, um, um, their own investigation a parliamentary investigation yes into the corona measures mm -hmm. um, that have been implemented since the beginning of 2020 and they have refused uh, several times um, so we decided my father and I we decided to um, do it ourselves then because yeah. if politics isn't gonna help us then so you observed measures taken in the Netherlands. Yes. Um, you were critical of those. Yes. And then you asked our parliament, hey, look into, into those measures. Are they really doing what they're supposed to do? Or isn't the, the damage uh, bigger than, than, the, than the gains? Yes. And, and they, they didn't respond or what? They, they responded, but they told us um, that it wasn't necessary, that they didn't think okay. there was any reason. Okay. Then you started to do it yourselves. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to talk uh, uh, in the context of a book. Bailey Lamont and myself are in the process of writing. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you a little bit more about that right now to, to show you the context of uh, a possible chapter in that book. And you know why yeah. you're here. That's why you're here. But this is, is my lead into that chapter. We're writing those chapters based on these interviews. Yeah, all right. All right. So I had only just taken Podcars Independent as an independent podcasting channel, late 2018. And I interviewed Mr. Thomas Drake. He is an NSA whistleblower. And at that time, I had just purchased, I just bought this table. This is a box, right? Yeah. This is an old chest thingy. This, this is my podcast table thing. Yeah. And when I interviewed Thomas Drake, he referenced the Pandora's box story. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So one of the things in that Pandora's box story is, yeah, well, you open the box and all, what, what comes out then? Yeah, all the bad stuff in all the, the universe, stuff. basically. And she wasn't supposed to open the box, but she did it anyway. And, huh. and all the bad things came out, but do you recall in the story what was on the bottom of the box? Not off the top of my head. It's uh, been a while. Okay. Thomas Drake said, when everything comes out and everything needs to come out, at the bottom of the box, there's hope. Huh, so when he was talking to me, he was one of my first, very first guests. I said, ha, huh, I just purchased that box. That's, this is my Pandora's box yeah, in its own right. That's what I'm doing here with these interviews, looking for hope. It's a cool metaphor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I interview people that give me hope, truth tellers, whistleblowers. And through their stories, I discovered red threads, lines, similarities in the stories. And no matter where in the world these people are or what they were blowing the whistle on, be it NSA like Thomas Drake or CIA or European Union or United Nations or Monsanto. We've, we've done a lot of interviews and we haven't finished. We, but yeah, there's, so, there's so much. The, uh, yeah. But um, no matter where these people come from, there's similarities in those stories. Mm. And that is the essence of, of the book we're trying to write. Hope being one of them. And um, September 2019, Bailey Lemon, who, who lives in Canada, and myself decided to put those interviews to chapters and write a book. 
We call it the Book of Courage, the Whistleblower's Book of Courage. Courage being one of those red threads also throughout those stories. And then coronavirus hit. Yeah. So uh, we basically pretty much stopped uh, writing. And we've only just um, picked up on that and we're finishing the book right now. It, it, it has been. But we have a lot of chapters that are pre-corona, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the world changed. Yeah. And the way I see it as a face shift, a face change, like... Like when you have paper, you set it to fire, it will not return back to paper. I don't know no, what, what it's yeah. not necessarily ashes what we're going to end up with, but it's not going no, to go back to... but it's not going to be the same. No. Exactly. So there's pre-corona chapters in our book and um, post-corona chapters. So this is my lead-in. Mm -hmm. And I met you by chance, by accident, outside of our Dutch parliament in yes. the summer of 2019. Yeah. Would you start... 2020, actually. 2020, you're right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It says 2019 here. So would you start off by telling us um, why you were there outside of our Dutch parliament in, in the sun outside? Um, and what were the events taking place back then that led to your initiative with the Buiten Parlementaire Onderzoekscommissie? Yes, um, I believe this was in June. And um, yeah. it was a few days, I think two or three days after my dad and I, we went to this protest um, on the Maliveld, which is a big field in the center of The Hague. Um, and there was a um, an anti-lockdown protest. And, um, well, we had been suspicious of everything that was happening pretty much since the beginning, um, because I've told you before... Um, I was sort of critical of society as a whole for years before Corona was a thing. So it didn't take me so long to realize that it was um, probably a hoax. Um, so we went to that protest um, and um, the police and the mayor had decided that it wasn't allowed to happen. And people basically said, yeah, we're not going to cooperate with that we're going to do the protest anyway and we went and a couple thousand other people went and um what happened in short was that the mayor then um he saw that people had come anyway and he um, decided to give us permission to stay and do our protest until i think it was 1 30 in the afternoon yeah, and then we were supposed to leave which people did and they left the field and they um, we walked together in the direction of the central train station. Um, but when we got there, um, the police and the mobile eenheid, the... Yeah, well, what is the, the, what the, is the term in English? That is, that is, it's an additional police unit that yeah, gets called a, when there's large crowd control is needed. Yeah, and um, they, they have shields and sticks and, and a water cannon. Yeah. And, you know, they were they were lined up near the station and they were also lined up near any... Um, what you're getting any, to is that there was violence enacted on the protesters. Yeah, they basically, they, they, they let us walk into a trap oh. and we couldn't, we couldn't physically remove ourselves from the scene like we were supposed to do. Yeah. So they, they said, remove yourselves from the scene. And when we tried to do that, they stopped us and then they um, enacted violence on us. And they... So I met you like a week after, or yeah. a couple of days after, and yeah. you were still... We, we were still pretty angry. Stressed and angry about what happened. Yeah, yeah. and we were there because um, there's an activist here in the Netherlands. His name is Willem Engel. Mm. And he, um, he was there to um, hand over a petition yeah. that he had uh, started. Uh, exactly. It's the largest petition in the history of the Netherlands. And I was there to cover that with my podcast yeah. channel. And he had invited it. us to come okay. uh, and be there. Okay, and fair enough. So that's where we met. And um, that's your history with the, with the corona measures and you, yourself being critical on that. Yeah. You then went to the demonstration in Berlin, uh, if yeah. I recall correctly. And you met Rainer Schöning. Well, we didn't meet the guy, actually. No. So but we tell us what happened in Berlin. Well, <laughs> and this was a couple of months after, it was about two months after that first protest that we went to. And um, the people of Berlin, there is um, there is this activist group there. Um, it's called Querdenken. 
and they uh, organized this protest and they had a lot of speakers lined up, including um, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. And um, they they invited everyone in Europe to come, basically. And we, we thought we hadn't started the committee yet at that point, um, but we did uh, have a website by that point where we wrote pieces uh, critical of, of the corona thing. Um, and then we went there because we thought we couldn't miss that. So you so, were looking for ways to express yourself. Yes, yeah, we basically. were. And then we found out when while we were there because people were handing out flyers for all sorts of initiatives, and um, we discovered that there was um, a committee there similar to what we are doing now, um, uh, and that was. Uh, done by Heiko Schöning and Heiko Schöning. Rainer Fulmich. Okay. And, um, well, we discovered that they were doing this and we thought, you know, we huh. should do this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the inspiration comes from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Heiko Schöning interviews people. Uh, you have m met him recently. Did you meet yeah. him in the summer last year also? No. No, oh, okay. No, it's the first time we met him a couple of weeks ago. Can you tell me... What was your impression of his initiative? Because it started in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I want to learn first from you how it started at one place in Europe and then spread at least to the Netherlands, but maybe other yeah. places as well. So what was his initiative and how did it land here with you and your dad? Well, he was um, interviewing people um, who, had, uh, who had information uh, of any kind about uh, the, the Corona thing and, and the, the lockdown measures that have been implemented. And, um, of course, just like us, he, um, he felt that it was, you know, a scam. And, um, he, he was interviewing people who, who had, you know, evidence, uh, of it not being genuine, you know? So he was interviewing doctors and lawyers and you know, all sorts of people. And, um, well, we thought that was a really good idea. And, and then we uh, decided to do this in the Netherlands as well. So I think uh, what was really important was that in Berlin, um, what was special about that day is that there were, there were so many people from so many countries who got to connect with each other and who got to talk about what they were doing in, in their own countries. And that is um, basically how, um, how it ended up also being a thing in the Netherlands. Um, Although, especially at first, we our style of working is a little different because we we also um, we make transcriptions and in the beginning we used to have a lawyer interview the people, um, but we decided after I think fifteen interviews that it wasn't exactly what we wanted. So now. We do the interviews ourselves, or my dad does, and you, you I, I write them down. Oh, yeah, but we'll get to that later um, in, in this talk. Just let's go back to Heiko Schöning. You say, and you mentioned it yourself earlier also, uh, you feel that it's a scam. Yeah. Let me try to uh, uh, interpret that and see if I got you right. You see this virus, you see this pandemic mm -hmm. spreading throughout the world you yeah. see measures being taken mm -hmm. and there's a certain you you feel like there's a disconnect between the measures what they aspire to achieve mm. and what like where a, a piece of cloth in front of your mouth would not necessarily help spreading a, a airborne virus for yeah. instance that would be one of the things that you'd be critical of um, yeah but it's it's more than that it's yeah. also it's not just that the things that they are implementing aren't helping it's also that they haven't this is the first virus that they've done this for. You know, we've had influenza for decades or for hundreds of years, actually, and they've never done this. That has been killing at least as many people as have been killed by coronavirus, but, but somehow this is different. What were and, the people that Heiko Schöning looked for to interview in his format? Did he also try to reach out to members of parliament? Of physicians? Who, uh, well, you? yeah, but I think he had a similar experience to the experience that we had, is that people who are in official positions, they refuse to cooperate and they, they do not want to give you information that is true or genuine. And so he, uh, he, he, he also looked for whistleblowers, you know, for people who would give him information. And I think he also had a lot of trouble, especially in the beginning. 
But now I think the um, German government has actually taken notice of this initiative. Um, of course, I don't doubt that it's with the intention of framing it or, or putting an end to it eventually. But, you know, at least he's been noticed now. And you have interviewed him yourself. So yes. he was the guest to your committee mm -hmm. uh, recently. Did he mention that? Yes, he mentioned that um, the government had actually taken notice of it. And um, I yeah, don't but think... the framing part. <laughs> oh, yes, the framing part, of course. Um, he is actually being... Um, he, he, uh, he has experienced a lot of resistance to what he's doing. Okay. And he, um, he, he, he told us how his bank accounts keep being blocked and they keep kicking him off of any social media. And, and he, he has experienced a lot more setbacks than we have so far. Why? Um, well, he's been at it longer than we have, I think. Only a couple of months. Yeah, only a couple of months, but still. Um, and I, I don't know, actually. I think Germany, I don't know. It's been... Maybe it, it's pushing back harder yeah. than the Netherlands are? Yeah, I think so, yes. I think so. How is he coming along on his path with interviews? What's the scale of his initi initiative in Germany at this point? Uh, point in time. I'm not sure how many, off the top of my head, he's done so far. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look. Or that traction up. that he's getting, with the he, output results. So. Well, um, well, he he has uh, gathered a lot of information, um, a great deal of information, and he. Um, well, but of course, in Germany as well, um, people are saying that he's crazy, and that the people that. Uh, voluntarily give him interviews are also crazy okay. and they're all conspiracy nut jobs and i think the pushback is a lot worse in germany i mean it's bad here but it, it's worse in germany i think um i think you can see that also um th there was recently an initiative by german actors who who were making satire videos um to criticize the lockdowns and they were you know shamed publicly and called nazis and and you know um people were saying that they're all far right extremists and that should never work again those kind of yeah things. that yeah i heard that yeah okay let's go back to your initiative so thank you for the introduction of where mm -hmm. it started in germany uh it, it it landed with you and your dad being founding members of the, of the dutch variety of this mm -hmm. you call it the bpoc 2020 yeah why what do you hope to achieve well, um, our primary goal is, of course, just getting the information out there because we feel that the government is lying, but also purposely withholding information from the people. Um, for example, um, regarding the uh, corona vaccines, they are not telling people what's in them. They are not telling people that it's only been approved until I think 2023. They don't tell people that it's still in the test phase. Um, they tell people that it's absolutely been proven to be safe, which is blatantly untrue. Um, so we just, and that is just one example of the things they're lying about. So I, we felt that it was important to get, to gather the information and of course with sources, um, and to get it out there to the people. So we put everything on our website and we um, we um, <laughs> we really uh, keep repeating that we want transparency. So we don't edit the videos um, of the interviews so people can have the full story. So here's the and format. You will be in a room that you found somewhere. When you started off, it was uh, like in, a, in the lobby of a hotel. Yeah, it kind was. Of, kind of a location. You would have a laptop there, microphones, camera on it, and you yeah. would start talking to, to your witnesses. Yes. Um, you have in, uh, invited political leaders. Yeah, all of them, actually. Uh, who <laughs> all of them have declined? Yeah. Have they? So far, um, no. Um, at, at, the, at, the, at the start, that's at what I mean. At the start, they First, all declined. Mm -hmm. yes. or, or didn't respond, maybe. Or they didn't respond. And when they responded, it was usually not them personally. You know, it was their secretary yeah, okay. or... So who else were you reaching out to and who and what was their response? Well, in the beginning, we um, we focused on the medical uh, side of things. So we wanted to know how deadly is this virus actually and who are the people who get really sick and die and um, are the 
lockdowns working to prevent it. And um, so we uh, initially uh, interviewed doctors and you know scientists. We were also very interested in the reliability of the PCR test. Uh, we've so okay. Just when you reached out to physicians, to mm-hmm. medical practitioners, how, how would you f- select them, and what would be their response? I mean, you call them and they would go, well, I don't know, or are they happy to talk? How does well in the beginning, of course, um, there people were hesitant because they didn't know us and it was a new initiative and um what was noticeable was that some people really wanted to wait and see what kind of people would go before them so so they wanted to be sure that we weren't you know tinfoil hat people (laughs) which i think is a terribly problematic term in itself but you know um so when big... I reach out, especially when I started podcast, when I reached out to guests, pretty much the only question that I would get is how many how, how many viewers do, viewers do you have? Yeah. And also. the cool thing about people like Thomas Drake, who I used to, in the introduction, is that he didn't really ask. No. I mean, uh, he was looking at what kind of stories do you deliver? Yeah. What's your format? And then he said, yeah, sure, I'll be your guest. With you, was it... Was it um... Um, can I trust you to ask to, to to be sincere? Was was it that well, kind of a response? Yeah, that as well. But it depends. It 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 was different for everyone that we asked. Okay. Um, because, for example, we heard um, uh, Peter Borger, who is a a molecular a molecular biologist, yeah. <laughs> um, and he uh, was actually pretty eager, you know, because he. Um, he had experienced framing and um, he actually worked in what he calls, you know, big pharma for years and had experienced that it's pretty corrupt. And he had been trying to tell people that this PCR test was not, um, you know, reliable for months and no one was listening to him. So when, when he got to our studio, he was actually very eager to talk and he, he talked drove for over from eight Germany. hours. Yeah. And he drove over from Germany as well. For this, yeah. And he, he, he kept saying, yeah, I'm sorry that it's this long and I didn't mean to talk for eight hours, but I'm just so angry and no one wants to listen to my so, knowledge. And when, when Julian Assange was taken from the Ecuadorian embassy in London, uh, at that time, that story was brought to the attention of Nils Meltzer, who's the rapporteur on torture for the United Nations. And Meltzer was reluctant at first to visit Assange and, uh, mm. and look into that story until he decided to do it anyway. And now he's just written a book on uh, on the torture of Assange. Um, I reached out to Meltzer at the time when he had just visited Assange. And he was very eager to talk to me, regardless of the size of my channel, because mm. he couldn't he couldn't find anyone listening yeah. to that story. The media exactly. was 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 not responsive. So Peter Borger had a fairly similar response yeah. to you. So Peter Borger is the is the Dutch guy who works in Germany, uh, who's written a um, retraction, retraction paper, paper yeah. to the Corona PCR test, and um, just before publishing that thing, he he volunteered his interview with yeah. your committee. Okay. Before that, you also talked to other doctors, medical doctors. Yes, we did. Has there? Did you at that time look at those people as whistleblowers? Was that a word that you would associate with your guests? Mm, I don't think that was how I looked at it in the beginning, but that developed after a while. I think around the time that we interviewed uh, Borger. I think it was in December. I think. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. What had changed that you started to perceive your guests differently? Um, well, the recurring theme was that people were angry with our guests for saying the things that they were saying, and they kept telling stories about how they were at risk of losing their jobs. Um, I think uh, another doctor that we heard, his name is uh, Jan Bonte. Um, he's actually got quite the following on Twitter now. Um, he actually <laughs> was he fired. Is, he is outspoken and angry on Twitter. Yeah, so that's he why is. he's got the following. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love him actually. But he <laughs> he actually did lose his job over Be- this. Because of his him being outspoken over the corona measures? Yeah, specifically uh, about the masks. 
because okay. he refused to wear one. And it wasn't even like he was trying to keep his patients from wearing one because I'm pretty sure he said, yeah, you know, if you want to wear Whatever. it, go ahead. But I'm not wearing it. And I will not be quiet about the fact that I think that it's useless yeah. and in some cases even harmful. Mm -hmm. So um, he lost his job over this eventually. So uh, you also talked to teachers, yes. psychiatrists, mm -hmm. researchers, have other guests up until December. We'll get to the January part and beyond after, uh, in, in a bit. Did other guests uh, suffer similar backlash? Yeah. Can you make an example <laughs> or what would be apart um, from Jan Bonte? There was this one woman and I really... You forgot her name. Yeah. It's okay. But she... And we can add, well, we can edit in the chapter later yeah, on. Yeah, we it, can. So in the book for she, the book, it matters not. Carry she on. founded a primary school, I think it was. And she was, she was fired or she was, you know, thrown out of the school that she founded because she didn't agree with the increasingly... Uh, dictatorial stuff that she was supposed to do to literal children. You know, she was against the whole mask thing and she was against the testing uh, policy. And because she didn't want to cooperate, they, the board actually threw her out. Mm -hmm. And this is the extent uh, of, of the things they will do to get you to be quiet. So, so the first couple of guests that you would ask, they would look at your initiative and say, well, I'll just see what uh, what quality of work you deliver. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you have a body of work after a couple of months and people see th that you're genuine uh, and that you publish transparently. So you, you're not framing yourself. Uh, you're, you're not framing your guests yourselves. No. Um, people would then be more willing to uh, be, be part of, of delivering their own testimony. Yes, after a while, they actually started applying themselves. There you go. So <laughs> is there a difference then? What kind of people would uh, f f connect to you guys and say, I want to testify also? Um, a lot of independent researchers. There was also this guy named Edzard Ravelli, um, who is a data analyst. And he, I think he applied to be interviewed himself. Um, also, school teachers... Uh, also a social worker um, who, um, th this woman, um, her name was Broers, Dirkje Deer Broers, I think. Okay. Um, she was a social worker and she, um, she had the responsibility to care for and to make medical decisions also for people um, who are developmentally challenged, you know, who are living in homes or people who are elderly and have Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and, you know... Um, so she uh, really wanted to tell us about how she, um, about the effects that the lockdowns were having on her clients, because she uh, also has to make financial decisions, for example, for these people. And, um, you know, what, we, what was noticeable was that they couldn't, they often couldn't visit uh, stores like the Action, which is a very cheap store here in, in the Netherlands where they can, where they used to go to buy, you know, laundry detergent and, and, you know, essential things, but the action sells them for a lot less than many supermarkets. And of course those stores had to close because they were considered non-essential. And now these people couldn't make ends meet with the money that they were given each week. And she couldn't give them more because it was against the rules. And these were often people who were paying off large debts. And, you know, so she couldn't give them more money. But she was the person that that her clients felt was responsible for the fact that they didn't have enough. You know, and she actually, a few months after her first interview, she came back to talk about how uh, people were being pressured to take the vaccine. And how she was being pressured to give permission. Um yeah even though she knew that her clients didn't want it or, or weren't capable of understanding the implications of it. So th these are the types of people who would volunteer to be interviewed. Would yeah. they consider themselves to be whistleblowers at the time when they reached out I don't out think you? so. And by no. now, do you think? 
I I don't know. Are you Maybe... keeping Are you keeping in touch with your former interview? Guest? Yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard because it's. Um, I think if you if you count the police officers that we've interviewed, we we've heard over a hundred and twenty people by now. So it's hectic, but yeah, yes. there's a lot. That's what but I'm saying. in touch with a lot of those people on Twitter as well. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is actually yeah, we'll get why to your Twitter. I will get to your Twitter <laughs> in a bit. Okay, keep that for for in a moment. In a moment. Okay, let's look at your committee. Um, you and your dad started this thing. You found a, a group of people. I believe there's five or six of you. How do you look at your committee? Are you journalists, or how would you describe yourself? Wow, um, I think at this point we would call ourselves journalists. Yes. Um, of course, my dad and I are the most active committee members, I think. Um, there are three other people involved. Um, they are more uh, advisory, you could say. Okay. Um, although one of them has also given us substantial amounts of money. He's actually invested in publishing the book as well. Okay. Um, but of course, my dad and I are the ones who, who are there physically every week and of course sometimes the rest of the committee yeah as well, maybe but... elaborate on that so you typically in the weekends you would be in a, in a room yeah um that, that, that was volunteered to you at, i believe yeah your dad would do the interviews and you would you would make take the notes you yes. would be typewriting mm -hmm. that's that's the modus operandi yeah <laughs> it is all right uh how's been the response of the media in that first half year up until december non-existent <laughs> Well, ex except I was there. Well, I mean, you were, but, you know, the, the mainstream media did not really okay. acknowledge us at all. How's been the response by politicians up until December? Also non-existent. Okay. <laughs> except for the emails that they had their secretary sent that they didn't want to be interviewed. Fair enough. How's been the response from abroad, from other countries? Um, I think after a while, of course, People started to be aware that we existed and we also got in touch with Heiko Schoening. And I think we also had some correspondence with some people in Britain who wanted to um, do the same thing there. Apart from Germany and the Netherlands and Britain. So that's three already. Yeah, that's you, three. Are there more initi initiatives like what you're doing, do you, to your knowledge? I don't think so. No. Not that I know okay. of, no. At what point would people begin to ask if they could be interviewed anonymously? Um, not that many people have actually, um, well, of course, um, there was a, oh, <laughs> there was a care worker. I saw that, that yeah. was the first one, I believe. Yeah, that was, that was someone that wanted to be outside of the view of the camera. So we filmed his empty chair and we had him sit yeah. outside of the frame. And, um, what was he afraid of? Uh, getting fired, I think. Um, also judgment, I think, from... Social pressure. Yeah. Okay. Um, has, other than Jan Bonte, has, has other guests, and so speak freely uh, up until now, like it's April now, mm -hmm. suffered backlash after testifying? I think so. Um, although I think also, I think a lot of people who have spoken to us are not really volunteering that information to the people that they work with, I think. So, I, was, I was present at one of the hearings and there were a, a couple of teachers there. Yeah. Like teachers to kids age 14 to mm. 17 or, or whatever. And I, I was watching that and I was teaching th th that group of kids myself uh, at, at that time. And I was thinking, well, if you're outspoken like this, you will probably get the talk with with the the, the, yeah. chief, the, the board or whatever, the chief of the school. Mm. Did, yeah, did, I think I think some of them have experienced some backlash. I don't know how many of them have actually lost their jobs. Have have has anyone apart from Jan Bonte, to I your knowledge? I don't know really. Oh, I I would okay. have to check. <laughs> okay. okay, we will get to. Um, What's but you should remind me of that because I will ask my dad as well and if yeah. he knows. And... Okay. Um, yeah, but they do experience social pressure, but mm. not to the point that they would lose their job or at least not to your knowledge. Maybe you, not are yet. They, are they grouping together? Are, are they support group initiatives? 
Well, um, I'm, uh, let me ask, I'm asking you this because I um, I also talked to, uh, so I'll lead up to, to, to this and then you, then you can, you can also, uh, which, whichever way you like to do it. Uh, I was talking to uh, Mr. John Kiriakou, who is a CIA whistleblower. We know that waterboarding, torture was taking place in yeah. Guantanamo Bay mm. through um, what John Kiriakou sh shared with the world. Mm. And I uh, re-invited him uh, on a New Year's Eve broadcast that I did. Yeah. And at the same time, I had Thomas Drake there. Yeah. And those guys, they know each other. And I was asking him, is there a club? And he said, yeah, actually, there's not too many of us. Uh, we, we, we we help each other. So we stick together. So those high profile guys, mm. they they would they would support each other. I was wondering if this happens with the teachers and the... Yes, it does. I don't think they're really clubs, but I know... I'm using the wrong word, but... That a lot of... Um, <laughs> support groups, maybe. Some of the doctors that we've, that we've interviewed are in touch with each other and they are now friends and, you know, they're connecting... Okay with each other over this, yes. Okay, okay. Now let's look at your uh, BPOC 2020. Um, you have published. Yeah. You, you decided to make a... Uh, a preliminary report. Thank yes. you. For, <laughs> I lost my English there. Pre preliminary report. You did, you, you got it in print. Uh, what's been the response to this thing? Um, <laughs> it's been overwhelming really because we we printed i think initially 2000 copies or something but yeah, you know first 2000 then it turned 5000 yeah or... it's it, we've sold i don't know how many actually oh. 7000 okay. maybe more um because people kept ordering them so so we had to print more mm -hmm. and um yeah it's been um really really big response yes I was with you. I made a report on you giving this book off to our members of parliament, yes. to our king, uh, to um, or other organizations. So I made a report on that thing. Uh, has there been backlash to you once you were more outspoken and saying, well, we yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what's course. happened to you? Well, I know, um, of course, we, since the beginning, um, even before the committee, you know, when, when we just had this more activistic website, we've been getting emails from people saying that we should die and, you know, um, delete your account. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course I get trolls on Twitter and in my email box as well, but the most, I'll be elaborate. So what kind of trolling are we talking about? Um, you know which kind of messages would keep you awake at night if, if they well do? they don't really but keep you know me awake getting... at night but you know there was this one guy which was actually pretty shocking or it was shocking to me because i didn't understand why someone would be so obsessed with us this guy first i think he sent emails because he was pretending to be genuinely interested and he wanted um sources you know articles um because what we do we keep a database of articles and other things um which back up the things that yeah if if i decide to give testimony if yeah. let's say I'm a, I'm a medical doctor and i make a certain statement you will ask me to substantiate that yes, so uh, we, and, we and you will keep a track on, on those yes and what we and we, he was looking for those yeah right? we, okay because we we do have um on our website um, it does say that um, if people want the sources for something that they can email us and we will send yeah. them. And we do. But th this guy, he kept coming back and saying that, that what our uh, interviewees were saying wasn't true and that, that it couldn't be substantiated. And, and he kept coming back. And my dad eventually just blocked him on the <laughs> server. Go away. And actually, maybe this is this is a little bit our own fault because, you know, we are both, you know, outspoken people, you know, don't mess with us people. And he he actually <laughs> made it so that every time this guy sent an email, he would get it back like 500 times. Oh. <laughs> and this guy and he, he actually got really mad. And then he 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 called my dad on the phone and and threatened him and okay. said that he should look over his shoulder when he walks down the street. And then he made a phony Twitter account pretending to be us. This sounds like <laughs> a, a waste of energy. Well, yeah, really, it it is because... So the 
interviews that we did with Rolly Post of European Union, Thomas Drake, John Kiriakou, Andrew McLeod of the United Nations, they would have their legal battles, but they, I don't think they would spend their time bitching with with whatever no. trolls are on the internet. No, so, no, we we don't we don't really. Do did you that. learn? Did you? Why why did? You? Well, we we block people. Now you block people. Well, yeah. And we blocked him as well, but he kept coming back. Okay. You know, when we blocked him on our email server, he started emailing the other committee members. Yeah. Okay. So he really didn't give up that easily. When we started, <laughs> you said Heiko Schöning, his uh, bank accounts has been blocked. Yeah. Um, have you suffered such financial backlash or uh, legal legal proceedings or those, those things? Not yet. Um, but... What has happened is um, in the Netherlands, the, the ministry, the, the Ministry of Justice, yeah, Justice Department, yeah, the Justice Department, they keep a list of potential terrorists, and um, many alternative media channels are on there. And but they recently did this report on the uh, anti-lockdown protests and you know the people who are activists and they mentioned us in that report and said that we were intimidating because we have uh, invited politicians to um, be interviewed and when they refuse we put their responses on our website so people can see that we invited them because one of the criticisms that we used to get is that we only uh, interviewed people who agreed with us and we wanted to show people that we, we are trying to get both sides of the story, but they're refusing. And we did this for transparency reasons. But they said that because we, we published their responses, that that was intimidation. And so they put us on this list of potential terrorists. Can you imagine it being uh, intimidating? Well, no, of course not. Because <laughs> well, the thing is, what you could also have considered is... To not publish those responses, but only volunteer them if people would ask them. Well, yeah, maybe. Like with the evidence have. pieces. I guess we could have done that. We could have, but you know, I've, I, I really personally feel that if we had, they would have found some other reason to put us on that list, because you know our publisher is on that list. He also has a um, a podcast type. Um, thing he has a studio as well yeah, my and colleagues the blue yes, tiger studio, blue tiger yeah, studio yes uh, i think flavio poschino is on there from black box uh oh tv oh yeah. this is this is funny. he's also about to be deleted from youtube so uh, yeah let's let's <laughs> make a little sidestep here so we're not time constrained and we're just <laughs> chatting along so um i was doing these interviews with podcasts not getting too much traction and then the coronavirus hit mm -hmm. and then my channel exploded in size yeah. i was talking to like the activist that you just mentioned. I also talked to Rainer Fulmich, mm. who is a lawyer who's taking the PCR test to court, basically in a massive class action lawsuit. And that was my biggest interview, over 200,000 views. So um, my channel got deleted from YouTube because yes. of that. I know. Um, a year earlier, and this was late 2019, our Minister of the Interior, Kaisha Ollongren, had a report written by a Dutch university about fake news. And she listed up to a hundred alternative media channels in the Netherlands mm -hmm. and she branded them as hyper-partisan junk news, yeah. fake news. Now my little podcast channel was in there as well. Yeah. However, I it, know. it was uh, mentioned on, on a, in, a, in a positive way. If you want to get to the truth, you have to cut through the smoke and mirrors, which is my leading elite in clip. So I was only mentioned in a positive way while all the other channels were blamed for being hyperpartisan junk news and fake news. However, my channel was the first to be removed from YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> so I got Which thrown off. Stupid. <laughs> I was deleted from YouTube on Christmas Eve. So yeah, I remember. So our stories of hope. This is, I feature a candle and I got removed from YouTube on Christmas Eve. Yeah. So like the night between was December. was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, well, I have to elaborate. But the night between December 24th and, and 25th uh -huh. by YouTube. So somebody at YouTube censorship department must think that's a cool joke and I, yeah, would, I, I would agree I would delete a candle channel at Christmas also having said that uh, the other ones are still there and I do not believe podcast is mentioned in the uh, national terrorism de no, department of our justice so. department so at least so. I'm not considered a terrorist no 
You're not, but, but you're, we are. You are, <laughs> and also, now, well, they're mentioning you in that report because yeah. your modus operandi is perceived as intimidating. Well, this is odd. I mean, if it's intimidating, they should be the judge of that and not say it's perceived as being intimidating. Um, but Flavio Paschino is in there with Black Marks? I think so, but you shouldn't... And Blue Tiger Studio also? Blue Tiger Studio, definitely, yes. Yes, he, he um, Tom Switzer, you know, the owner, yeah. is actually has before Corona even was being framed as, as being a far right extremist Nazi Where sympathizing, would, you know. <laughs> well, I actually, I, I don't, so I, I will not go into the <laughs> substance of, of that no. uh, allegations. I, I just, I'm not, I'm, I just don't know. H uh, however, I would agree with that terrorism department that you are threatening, uh, as am I, threatening the, the state system in the Netherlands. Yeah, I, I mean, so, we have yeah. our government taking measures. You're critical of, of those outside of the juridical system. Well, yes. I'm, I'm sure that we are threatening to the people who want to continue implementing whatever it is thereafter, you know. So in, in looking at it like that, not being a terrorist, I mean, you, you're the fur farthest thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, we'll get to funny. your contact with the Justice it's Department funny. in a moment. Um uh, um, you started investigating or interrogating, no, it's not interrogating, you started interviewing yeah. uh, people from the police department Yes. Uh, as of early this year Yes. or late last year. And something changed there with your way of work. I mean, yes. typically you would interview people, you would do it transparently, you do it live even, mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't for, with the police officers. No. Even the first one, you didn't. Why? No. Because... Um, that was actually uh, what we planned on doing. We planned on, on doing those things live in the studio, you know, with their faces recognizable. And um, we we actually, we asked them to show their badges, you know, so we would know that, that we weren't dealing with, you know, trolls or... Um, People renting a costume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but what actually happened was that no one wanted to be the first. Because they said, um, well, it's going to have consequences if I do this. And if I'm the first and I get, you know, shamed I or fired or... Yeah, exactly. And then other people after me are not going to want to do this because they're going to see what happened to me. And then I'm going to be the only one losing my job or, you know, getting threats. or So they no one wanted to be the first. So that was the that was the first problem. Would, would, it, would that response be out of fear for their own security yes definitely or out of fear that the story wouldn't be as told as broadly as elaborately as it could be i think both but i think many of these police officers and we actually realized um as we interviewed more of them we started to realize that they're scared and a lot of them are literally they've been traumatized many of them are now uh, they now require um, psychiatric. psychiatric treatment because of the things that have happened to them and the things that they were forced to be involved in. Now, if you work as a police officer or in, in law enforcement, you would you would get traumatized with the, that's 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 one of the health risks of your work, yes. regardless of Corona crisis or whatever. Of course. But in the context of the last year, mm. what would what how would you describe th that trauma then? Well, what they're describing is that um, this is something that has escalated since uh, the coronavirus has hit, but it has been going downhill for many are saying the past 10 years. So the culture in the police force has shifted, I think, from uh, wanting to help people and keeping them safe to actually being, you know, dictators <laughs> and um, um, enacting violence on people. A lot of them, several of them, have mentioned uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2015, there was this guy from Aruba. And I don't know exactly, I don't remember exactly what happened or what was the, um, the reason why they were trying to arrest him, but what happened was he was killed during his arrest. And... Several of the police officers that we've interviewed have mentioned that the officers who 
were responsible for this were on drugs, um, on speed uh, specifically, and that they were extremely violent with this guy. And that that is a, a pattern that has been forming for almost a decade now. But of course, since the coronavirus measures, um, it's been escalating. And um, they have been enacting violence on civilians um, because um, they've been told to do so from higher up. So it's not, you know, they're not incidents. This is actually, um, these are orders that they're getting from their superiors. When we started to talk, uh, uh, I um, asked you to describe how we first met. Mm -hmm. You were at the demonstration a week earlier. That was one of the first violent breakups of yes. a demonstration in the Netherlands. Yes. It's that kind of police violence that you were talking about. Yes, and it's actually gotten a lot worse, you know, because I was there on that day in June and I had to run from the water cannon and I saw people being beaten, but... Okay. Um, the the protests that are happening now or that have happened in the in the in the past couple of months have actually the, the violence ha has been getting worse. You've been collecting these interviews with police officers for weeks. Yes. And uh, that turned out how many uh, how many are you now? Like fifty over fifty? Fifty three. Yeah, over fifty. But thirty are still waiting to be interviewed. So that's 80 in People all? People are still applying, yes. You mean there's 80 in yeah. all and you've done mm -hmm. 50 of yeah. them? Okay. Right around that time, you published your book, I Was With You. We delivered that to the parliament. And then a week later, um, you also went to the Ministry of, of Justice, to the Justice Department, to deliver those books. Now, let me lead into how, what, what happened there. Um, you thought you were going to give your book to our Prime Minister. Yes. because <laughs> Naively that, so. That was... The way that this happened is is so so weird because we didn't ask him, you know. Because you, uh, you asked him for an interview, but you didn't ask him to. No, we oh. didn't because you know we didn't we didn't expect. Um, what, what we did is we we asked to hand this uh, report over to uh, the head of the, the chair, the chair, yeah, yeah, of the House of Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Khadija Ari, yeah. and she agreed, and um, that that actually took some discussion because she wanted us to come in and wear masks, and which of course we wouldn't do. So she agreed to come outside and take it from us. Okay, so we made this disappointment with her, but then um, uh, the the secretary, I think, of the prime minister. Um, they reached out. They, they reached out to us, and yeah. they said that the prime minister had taken notice of our contact with this uh, with, with Miss Arib, and um, that he wanted to uh, to take the report from us himself. Yeah. And we said, "All right, cool, we'll do that." That's yes, cool. Yeah, finally, we'll get our media. We get, we'll get. Yeah, exactly. So we we were going to be in uh, Newsport, and, and which is the media outlet where, yeah. where all the. the but uh, politicians would Yeah, this was going to be a very big thing, yeah. you know. And then the day before this was supposed to happen, we were contacted by the Justice Department, you know. And also, this was again the... The, the terrorist, the yeah. anti-terrorist group yeah. of the Justice Department. Yeah? Exactly. And they informed us that our meeting was being cancelled because it was a safety risk. Yeah, they and couldn't guarantee the safety. Did you learn what kind of safety? No. We asked, they wouldn't tell us. Okay. So <laughs> so it was cancelled then. Yeah, I was. I, I, I had a front row seat on these events. Yeah, you did. The, 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 the funny thing is, of course, they can arrange for a room where you can safely hand this thing over yes, to our prime course. minister. And that can be safely filmed. So it wasn't that kind of a safety that no. they were implying. No, of course it wasn't. And And... I don't know what they were thinking. Like, so you didn't give the book to them. Fair enough. Fine. We'll give it to somebody else. Yeah. Then you were contacted with the, uh, by the Justice Department again because they still wanted the book. Yes, but well, um, they still wanted the book. But they um, they specifically contacted us about these uh, interviews with police officers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Minister of of Justice, his name is Vert Grapperhaus. He um, he wanted to talk with us about this. And um, he actually 
uh, said that he would uh, he would set a date with us and and he would he would make an appointment with us and he would let us know when and he didn't basically yeah <laughs> so I had a front row seat on that as well um, so after being stood up by our prime minister yeah you this were... happened again <laughs> but what keeps happening is they keep contacting us and then ditching us yeah. And I don't understand why they would contact us in the first place if they weren't planning on going through with it. That that's actually my confusion here. So it is my understanding, and I'm I'm implying causality, but let's see how this works. Um, you get, got media attention, and, mm -hmm. and the police officers got media attention, and you got threats, and you were also outspoken on Twitter and social media yeah. as being intimidated. This these things started after being stood up by the Minister of Justice, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, I think was so. There a, was there a correlation in events there? Or was I think so. Um, well, things pretty much blew up after the publication of the report, of course. Uh, my Twitter actually really started growing after this happened. Um, I now have, I think, 3,000 followers or something, which is a lot for me. <laughs> because my Instagram still has 67 and... <laughs> <laughs> don't say that you'll get what's this published. no my instagram is personal oh, i don't i don't let people follow it <laughs> but um but it's I, re not... I recall you starting twitter and and uh, your dad as well and uh, you were new to that medium yeah and i've has, never it, been on twitter before so what <laughs> so let's talk a little bit on twitter so what's your experience <laughs> on twitter how would you um what's what's the what's the coolest experience that you've had um well the coolest experience is that people really really seem to like me or at least some people and actually someone which is really bizarre last week or a week before that someone sent me a picture of Joan of Arc and they that actually, will be you yeah <laughs> you got fans I I do which is which is cool it's cool it, it was a little uncomfortable for me at first. oh it's extremely uncomfortable I had to go through that <laughs> thing it's <laughs> because you know a, a year ago I was a waitress you know, it. so it's... Yeah, well, there's virtue in every line of work. So. Well, yes, of course. But, you know, I was always... I was never a social media person. You know, I had yeah, an Instagram okay. for my closest circle, but... Okay, let's... let's. Uh, I have a question on social media. Um, uh, you got started and you were a couple of months into your interviews. You decided to abandon Facebook for its censorship. And, I did. Uh, well, the, the committee did also. The committee I mean. did also, but... But my... you didn't. You know, uh, this is actually a thing that my dad and I have different opinions on. Yeah, fair enough. So describe because, both opinions. Well, I personally believe that we should leave Facebook. I think we should be trying to gather attention for things like Gap and MeWe and uh, I think it's called Parler. Yeah, other things. Open you up know, free platforms. Yeah, sense exactly. Of, but but you of are course, on Twitter. I am on Twitter, yes, um, which I also think eventually I should leave because um, it's okay. Let's let's focus on the committee. You had intended to leave Facebook, you didn't. Was that's where the I, I mean, I for my experience, that's where the Dutch are. So if you want to reach yeah. out to the Dutch people, you will be on Facebook for the yes, time being. Yes, for the time being. Yes, which which of course I have accepted, and which is also why I agreed to make a Twitter account. But I think. You know, deep in 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 my heart of hearts, you know, I think we should be making our own social media. I also think that we should be making our own YouTube, okay. so we cannot be removed or censored. Or now, you described earlier in this talk that after the first couple of interviews, new guests would see, oh, th those th they're they're sincere. Mm. So I will be part of this, and then you would get your guests uh, to accept easier. And I have not seen one interview that was not sincere. So uh, all my compliments to the way you do this. Thanks. <laughs> However, you have been censored by YouTube also, or got uh, warnings. Yes, we have. So we're fully expecting to be deleted. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> to are. To the point where you have created your own video platform and invested yeah. in that. Yeah, we're, we actually pay quite a lot of money for that. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, you've <laughs> created your uh, report. Mm -hmm. And then um, you got stood up again by a minister, like this time by our minister of justice. 
then you decided to publish the police officer uh, interviews anonymously, like written statements only? For the time being, yes. Do they consider themselves to be whistleblowers? You think? Some of them do, I think. Um, but I think m many of them are, are feeling really guilty as well because they they feel and they are they are also told by their colleagues that they're traitors you know and um i i recall um one interview which was recently published um which was a a, a male officer uh, telling us about a um how, how he got directed to our initiative by a female colleague and she um she sympathizes with you know the anti-lockdown activists and she doesn't want to beat people and and you know be a be a dictator and they actually visited her at her house where she lived on her own and they said they were going to rape her and who is they but her colleagues other police officers they went to her house and they told her they 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 gave her rape threats and you know all sorts of terrible things and then this this um the, the, this person who who told us about this he is a man and he stood up for her and he he told his his colleagues that this was unacceptable and and that he was against this and so he is now also known for being a um you know a tinfoil head sympathizer yeah, okay. You know, and now he is also receiving threats, and 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 these same people who threatened this female police officer are also now uh, saying to him that they will deal with traitors accordingly. You, you know, you, you and used, you used the word word guilty a moment ago. Are they guilty for enacting violence on citizens? Is is that the guilt part? Partly, yes. Um, we have we have spoken to a to an officer who had participated in the violence and who was actually having trouble living with himself and who was having suicidal thoughts as well as a result of this. But also um, a lot of them feel that it's disloyal towards the police force to be a whistleblower. You know, they, they, they feel like they're betraying their colleagues by doing when you, this. Are you, are you there when they give confession? I used to work. I was playing with the word confession. confession. No, that I was going to ask about uh, confession. No. It slipped out here because I was working on on that word. No, let it, me rephrase it as a question: Is it is it are, is are they giving confession? I think in a way, in a way, they are some of them, because not all of them have agreed to be part of it. You know, um, we've spoken to a lot of officers who have called in sick so they can avoid uh, having to uh, enact violence on people. Um, but we've also spoken to people who have been violent with uh, protesters. But also, it's not just the protesters. It's also people who do not abide by the rules on the streets. Oh, yeah. When you're in a supermarket, not wearing exactly. a mask or whatever. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And, um, you know, also violence against teenagers who are, you know, seeing their boyfriends or girlfriends outside after 9 p.m., you know, and that, that sort of thing. Um, um I think one of them also told a story about how he had to remove a 13-year-old boy from a classroom because he wouldn't wear a mask. And, you know, really, really terrible things. Okay, one of the most well-known uh, publishers globally would be Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in prison, uh, awaiting extradition or vertical kind of extradition trial case. And I yeah. was in London watching how that would proceed uh, like a year ago, February last year. I was there mainly to see if Dutch press was going to cover it. No one was there. So here's no, the biggest publisher not. standing up for yeah, it's, it's <laughs> against terrible. war crimes. Nobody's uh, giving it any attention. This is leading into a question. You have your report out. I mean, you're, you're picking a fight with the prime minister and with the minister of justice and with the anti-terrorist department yeah, of, well. of the minister of justice. Has the media reached out to you by now? Yes. Oh, how did that go? <laughs> um, well... Um, that has been going on since before, since before we published this, um, journalists have been asking for interviews with us personally, but we have refused because we don't want 
any media attention that we get to be about us personally because we know how that tends to go. You know, um, this other activist that I spoke of earlier, Willem Engel, he has dreads, he's a dance teacher, and he, he gave personal interviews. And all they're talking about now in the mainstream media is the fact that he's a hippie with dreads. So um, I know how it will probably be framed if we give personal interviews. So we've refused to do that um, so far, but um, there is a... Um, uh, a TV sender, a, um, a, a television channel that has now um, contacted us, RTL, who want to do uh, an issue on the police hearings. Okay. And we have actually tried to get into uh, Op 1, uh, but they refused us because they said that um, they couldn't verify that was really police officers uh, being interviewed. However, we have put the... We, we have video... Uh, of every interview and it's uh, actually been put in a safe with a uh, notary who if we ask him to will sign a uh, you know in um, a verklaring a, um, statement. a statement yes uh, an official statement saying that these that these are genuine videos and that these are police officers who are identifying themselves by batch number but they they didn't they, so you compromised the transparency that you started out with. We did. For source protection, basically. For source protection, yes. And also because, um, of course, there are privacy laws. And these people, one by one, kept withdrawing their permission to publish the videos. So did any we of cannot, them... we, our hands are tied. Yeah, basically. did any of... Yeah, but also, I mean, if, if your guest is, is retracting his statement... Or at least his name. You would you would do that. Yeah, exactly. You? So we we can't have have these have any of your guests, police officers, but also the other ones, ask you to retract their statement. No, they have only asked us not to publish it under their names. Okay. Um, yeah, and you mentioned Op Ain, which is a Dutch TV channel. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the one yeah, of the that, programs. it's like a news program, and they they didn't think that the. Uh, statement from the notary was good enough. They wanted to be given the contact uh, contactgegevens. The, yeah. They wanted they wanted to be put in touch with the with the officers personally, which of course we refused. And then Do they you didn't believe them to be genuinely interested as a journalist. No. <laughs> but one of the biggest uh, <laughs> revelations currently in the Netherlands is done by Peter Klein, who who has broken open a, a very big scandal in the Netherlands. Uh, he's with RTL. Yes, which is why I think we trust RTL the most at this point, because they actually have um, agreed to do an issue with us. Uh, we I think we're going to be in the studio as well okay. uh, with them. And, and they want to do um, an issue on us without the identities of the police officers. They They think that the notary is good enough, you know, so... That's we, we've agreed to do that. You have published the first couple of politicians that uh, refused to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. um, have you also been into contact? I mean, this is in the context of the Corona crisis. So in the Netherlands, we also have a, a CDC, Center yes. for Disease Control. It's called the RIVM. Um, so have you also reached out to them? Mm -hmm. Have they declined? Have you published yes. those? Yes. Okay. Also, we've invited members of the outbreak management team who have also refused. Um, so. Okay. All right. Um, where f where to from here? <laughs> um, well, right now, um, of course, we're we're focused on the on the police interviews, but also um, for the live interviews in the studio, we are now trying to focus on the vaccine. Um, we are um, trying to uh, to get people to come to the studio who have experience with uh, adverse effects, you know, uh, or if they know people who have died. Um, actually, there is this um, home for, for the elderly in, in uh, here in the Netherlands where I think 31 people have died after they were all vaccinated. And of course, the media are saying and it was coronavirus it was an outbreak um but now we've contacted this mortician um 
uh, he has he has also been in the studio with uh, with Flavio on Black Box, mm -hmm. and he has actually gotten permission from the families to dig these people up and perform autopsies on them, because when people die of coronavirus or when they are reported to have died of coronavirus, um, often there are no autopsies done. Um, so they're just buried and, and they're stamped with their coronavirus deaths. But, you know, we have this suspicion that they died because they were vaccinated. So these people will be dug up and then autopsied. This is going to happen. This is going to happen, yes. When? Um, <laughs> it is just genuinely... When? Uh, soon. Okay, fair, okay, cool. <laughs> soon. But, you know, this is, I think... Um, we, we haven't we haven't actually published that yet, but I'm telling you this now because you know it's not live. And, okay, and, okay. Uh, if, and by the time the book comes out, it will be public knowledge. So, <laughs> well, Anthony Fauci is with the American uh, RIVM, with the who's the, the well-known physician that everybody in the United States supposedly listens to. He's done research on um, the Spanish flu victims. He's dug them up. And he's found he has found that those people had died of uh, bacterial pneumonia. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, interesting that we're. Which I think is also true for many coronavirus. That's. Uh, well, let's see but... what happens. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want to revisit the police officer um, interviews that you did. Uh, has any of those police officers considered to use whistleblower portals? There's there's software out that you can use to volunteer your information so that it would land to the big publishers. Has they has anybody considered that? Or whistleblower protection programs, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Not really. Um, uh, many of these people are really... Um, they're not in a good place mentally. <laughs> you know, We've actually uh, contacted a psychiatrist from our network. That, of course, we, we have an extensive network of people now. And one of these psychiatrists has volunteered to uh, to be available for these people because many of them are not doing well. And um, I think it was a lot of it took a lot of courage from for many of them to to even come to us, even anonymously. You know, they're always afraid that they're going to be outed as being, you know, traitors. <laughs> one of the common. Um observations that you will have talking to whistleblowers is that that it's a lonely job yeah. <laughs> it's maybe the most lonely job that there is i think so yeah. you're uh, you're um, you're isolated you're demonized um you're hurt financially slandered you lose your job and yeah it's lonely that's that's the common denominator the reason that i asked you here in this interview is that i see your project the BPOC as a as a very hopeful project. Yeah, it's now not so just the one guy with the NSA or the one no. Snowden or the one Chelsea Manning or it's like dozens. Are they still alone and isolated, or are they taking no. courage from a project like yours? Yeah, I think so. Um, that is also a very common response that we receive from people. Um, many people say that they keep donating to us and they keep sharing our messages because they find it very hopeful um, that so many people are coming to us and 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 giving interviews and, and providing information and um, you know many of them are also in contact with each other the police officers too by the way they are we have put them in touch with each other because they asked us to when you started you said um, I mean when you started this project you said, uh, well, uh, we feel that our parliament needs to investigate. They're not going to do it. Well, we'll do it ourselves then. Mm -hmm. Has that mission changed? What's your mission today, if I would ask you of your mission statement, if you will? Well, um, well, of course, it's still to get the information out there. It's still to inform the people uh, of, of this country. But also, um, we're, we are trying to get some stuff translated as well, because... We still want to get all the information out there. But for me personally, it has also very much become about, you know, connecting with people who have the same views as I do. Um, because I told you before that I have always been 
a tinfoil hat person, <laughs> as they call it. You know, I have all, I have I have been researching things. Just rebrand yourself to out of the box thinker. Yeah, or I think so. Independent you know, thinker. I, or... But I that that is what I have been since I think 2014 or something. When I think it started when I watched a documentary named Zeitgeist. Um, the first time I saw that, that was when that was when I started researching. You know the 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 elites and you know all the big banks and and so i've been into this stuff for years and so of course when when this coronavirus thing started happening the first thing on my mind was oh no oh no this this is this is the thing they've been talking about is going to happen for years because these people um people who are interested in this um in in this type of stuff they have been saying for years that there will be one day a big event that will be used as you know justification to implement a global police state so when this started happening i was suspicious were, of it immediately because yeah. i i thought oh no now you were one of the people prying open pandora's box i think so you had a front row seats peeking in yeah i think so has and that thing shown itself to to you to be bigger than you had yeah. thought? Um, well, bigger, yes, Dirtier, I think. Dirtier, smellier? <laughs> yeah, it's, of course, it's always worse than you think in the beginning. Is it? Well, yes, of course. Because I used to think that it was, you know, a, a few people at the top of the pyramid and, and they um, that, that, that they knew exactly what was going on and that many people, that most people didn't know about it. But now... I think actually that most people working in government in, in at least in the top layers of the government they know and they don't care so that that is something that this corona thing has has shown me it's not just the puppet master it's no. en ingrained all through yeah I think so through top management yeah have top management volunteered interviews already are they reaching no. out to you or is it the workers the, the, the there is one politician from the opposition who wants to he interviewed now. Yeah, I heard that. He, I heard him say that, but yeah, he hasn't shown up. Well, he has actually um, uh, been been planned oh, uh, okay, in, into enough. the agenda now. I think it's May 15. Okay, last, uh, la last question so. then for me, and then you can close however you like. Uh, if this is Pandora's box, and you've been working on getting the, the bad stuff out and, and mm. setting transparency on that thing, do you feel you're approaching its bottom? Or no. are you halfway through? How far along are you? Or haven't you? No, a you know, I don't. It's it's hard to say because for me, um, you know, we are working on the Corona thing now. But actually, for me, the Corona thing is part of a very very large whole, which is which includes you know ritualistic abuse of children, um, and fraud in in the economic system, um, the World Bank, uh you know controlling everything it it's it's just it it's not isolated you know so i feel that even if we ever finish this investigation into the coronavirus thing there will still be so it much will, other stuff it will spin off to other yeah, topics as well okay. i think so yeah the book that i'm writing with bailey lemon is called the whistleblower book of courage one of the common threads through all those stories is the, these are courageous people i mean they're looking around in their offices in the lines of work and saying, well, if nobody stands up, I'm going to do it. I mean, I didn't sign up for, if I'm a police officer, I didn't sign up for beating innocent yeah. civilians. And, and that's what these whistleblowers do. Do you consider yourself to be courageous? Is what you're doing, does that take courage? Well, I, I know other people are saying this about me, but I personally, I feel like I, I didn't, it's not, it didn't feel like a choice. It just felt like something I had to do because it was the right thing to do, you know. And of course, sometimes I'm I'm afraid that one day the police are going to show up at my doorstep and raid my house, you know, which is of course a a possibility because it's happened to other people. But I don't feel like quitting is really an option anymore. It it's it's not really a a conscious choice it's just something that i do be, because i feel like i have to because I, I i feel like well someone has to and i'm in the position where i can 
Um, Because, you know, I have other friends who who share my views on this, but they are not as outspoken about it because, you know, one of them is a primary school teacher. She has a child. You know, they have mortgages. And yeah, I feel I feel more free to do this because I I don't really have a job that I'm going to lose because of this. You know, I, I, I work at the reception of a hotel at night. It's not like they're going to fire me You feel from safe. Yeah. Okay. What gives you... Safer. Ho- safer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, safer than the... Than safer the, than other than people. the person that needs to pay off their mortgage at the end of the exactly. month. Exactly. Take care of their kids. You know, I live in a studio apartment that I rent, you know. It's... What gives you hope? Um, The fact that I realized that there are more people who know about this stuff than I thought before the corona thing. I used to have three friends that I could talk to about this. And my dad also used to think I was crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And um, the fact that this happened has actually um, connected me to a lot of people who, uh, who feel the same way, including you actually. (laughs) And, um, so that is actually very hopeful for me because I do believe now that, that there will be, it, it, at least there's a possibility that someday it won't be like this anymore. And, and the people who, who run this world will not be corrupt anymore. And it, there, there is a, there is going to be some sort of end point to this. And I never, I, I, I always thought I was going to die um of old age maybe you would, and you would, would live still to see be, that day? yeah exactly <laughs> but now it's going to happen in your lifetime so well, maybe a, yeah that's a positive thing yeah okay okay thanks for uh for sharing all this with us um thanks for being here and for so that's if if, if i summarize what you're doing with with the bpoc 2020 uh-huh. it's it's um it's it's to get that momentum in society there, yeah to get awareness to get people to inform themselves yeah very it, much so yeah and it's and, and what you're saying is that it's working <laughs> yeah for for a lot of people i think so yes faster than you had thought of or thought of when you started or yeah you know because it's only been i think it's, it's, it hasn't been a year <laughs> it's the committee has has only been active for i think 7 months yeah Something like that, because this this protest that we started the conversation with was only it was in June. Yeah, June twenty first or twenty fourth. So that's ten months ago. Yeah. So that's insane, because <laughs> it seems much longer now because so much has happened, but it's, right. it's only been a short time. Okay, so uh, I will uh, uh, get you to uh, let's do the end tune here. There you go. I'll get you in touch with uh, with Bailey also. Get you to meet yes. her. We might want to do a, a, a follow-up talk with, with each other yeah, that's, that's, through through internet. That'd be great. Yeah, thanks for being here. Of course. Uh, being part of this project. Yeah, of course, you're <laughs> welcome. No problem. It's going here today over samenhorigheid. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Decision to make. Decision to make. You think I'm joking? Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. Laat staan dat ik kan ingaan over vier.